World Congress of Endourology. I'm Dr. Michael Lipkin from Duke University, and I'll be moderating this discussion with Dr. Julio Davalos, who's on my right, who's the director of the Advanced Kidney Stone Program at Chesapeake Urology in Maryland in the United States, and Dr. Roger Sir, who's the director of the Comprehensive Kidney Stone Center at the University of California in San Diego, also in the United States. This event is sponsored by Boston Scientific, and we are paid consultants. The intended audience for this broadcast is healthcare professionals. Any patient seeking medical advice should consult their physician. The broadcast is streaming live on the Boston Scientific Urology Twitter and YouTube channels, and we invite you to share uh, on your personal channels as well. The topic for our discussion is achieving the ideal access for percutaneous stone surgery, and the discussion will include a live question and answer session at the end. If you'd like to submit a question, you could type it directly into the broadcast, or you could publish it on Twitter using the hashtag StoneSmart. Our team will answer your questions in the last 15 minutes of the broadcast. And with that, I'd like to get uh, started with the discussion. And we're going to start with the uh, preoperative planning and the actual um, obtaining of the access. And I'm going to start with you, uh, Julio. Um, how do you determine when you're approaching a stone case where you want to place your access? So I think there's some principles that uh, you know most of us follow for access. I mean, I think the most obvious uh, point to make is that you want to put your access where you can get to the stone that you're wanting to treat. Um, of course, there's sometimes limitations uh, depending on the particular anatomy of a patient. Um, and then there are other um, you know, uh, things to consider. Um, I always use a CT scan, particularly uh, I believe it's most helpful in the sagittal view to get the perirenal anatomy. So you may find a point of ideal access, uh, perhaps would be in the upper pole, so you had a bifid system with a large stone burden, but then you realize that uh, doing kind of an end calyx uh, along the long axis kind of access would per perhaps uh, injure a solid organ or come in proximity to the pleura, so then you have to change your plan a little bit. Um, so I, I think that you know, the bottom line is you want to create access directly onto the stone, um, but you want to avoid you know, causing injury or harm in, in the tract that you create. So that's sort of just broadly speaking. Can I comment on that? Yeah. So when I first got out of my residency, the only access site that I would ever choose would be the lower pole because that's what I was comfortable doing. I was not comfortable getting access to it through a mid calyx or definitely not the upper pole. And through that lower pole, I got most of my stones free. You can use a flexible scope to go to the upper pole. The point what I'm trying to uh, make here is that although it's ideal if you have the ability to go to all the different uh, calyces, it's not a showstopper if you only have the ability to go through one. Typically, the lower pole is what is the low-hanging fruit. People are more comfortable doing that. But as people gain an increased mastery of getting access, perhaps they get mid and upper pole capabilities, that, that only enhances your uh, ability to... Um, do the PCL procedure. But again, doing having the ability to only do a lower pole, I don't believe is a showstopper. And for those who are trying to learn mastery of it, I think there's something to be said for um, that. And, and for, for many of the urologists out in the community who are not getting their own access, um, how would you guys suggest they best interface with their interventional radiologists in, in sort of planning the procedure and, and communicating where best to get access. Yeah. Um, herein lies kind of a, a political issue at times. In many uh, uh, situations, there's politics, uh, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, getting access is a, a technique that urologists can do as well as radiologists. And both people have to be able to play nice in the sandbox, but that doesn't always exist, obviously. And so... Uh, if it doesn't exist, then that's a problem because more often than not, the radiologist is going to want to do it, and he's, he, he or she will unlikely want you to do the access. Um, so that being said, then you just have to work with them uh, on letting them do it, but then trying to communicate. And oftentimes I would say it's a face-to-face -face meeting because trying to do things via email or telephone doesn't always work when you want to get to a very specific <clears throat> calyx. You have to actually show them. Um, so that would be, that's been my experience uh, in different situations. Yeah, I, I would uh, piggyback on those comments. Um, in training, um, I 
where I trained, uh, we did not obtain our own access. Um, we always used an interventional radiologist. We had an excellent interventional radiologist, um, and we would have face-to-face -face meetings with her and literally tell her we want this calyx or we want this area. Um, and most of the time, you know, she was able to give us what we needed. But it definitely involves being, you know, very active with, with the interventional radiologist to, to really let them know what you need. I think it, having helped many community urologists over the years learn access and talking to them about their experiences with interventional radiology, they have, there's a lot of negative stories out there. But I think some of that is, um, you know, you just send a patient, in essence, to get a nephrostomy tube placed the radiologist is going to place it wherever they can easily place it, not necessarily considering, you know, surgically, is this the right place to, to treat the stone? I think when you take the time to develop a relationship in any area of your life, and particularly here, in, in, in if you're having to work with an interventional radiologist, I think that's important to develop that relationship so you can get that, you know, optimal care for your patient. So, so Julio, you mentioned that during your training, you trained at a place where the interventionalists got access. So how did you go about uh, learning and getting yourself um, to the point where you're obviously not just comfortable, but an, an expert in access? What was that process like for you? Uh, in one word, it was painful. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I, and then I didn't do fellowship either. So I didn't get that added benefit of training somewhere. Um, that, that gave me that, that skill set. So I, I very much did what, what I help others do now, which is um, I spent time with experts uh, visiting their ORs, um, going to courses, uh, ultimately developing some of my own techniques, uh, my own understanding, and basically just perseverance. And, and um, the other thing for me was I was involved in a training program on the uh, teaching side, so I was uh, faculty in kind of a newer program uh, in West Virginia that uh, gave me the opportunity to also have a lot of patients that needed that kind of care and I was the, sort of the go-to guy for it. So I think that's, you know, I think anytime you're trying to learn something new, if you have the ability to kind of keep practicing at it, um, you know, that, that's always helpful. And, and, and Roger, I would put forth the, the same question to you. Your, your techniques have evolved over time as well. And, um, I know you're using more ultrasound in the operating room, and, and sort of describe how how you started, how you a approached learning it, and then how you brought it into the OR. So when I first started doing my own access, I would choose the, the lowest hanging fruit. I'd choose the easiest cases. Uh, in my mind, easy cases would be uh, not a complete staghorn, maybe like a two centimeter stone. But in particular, having a case that has a lot of hydro is nice that kind of is more of a softball because you know you just need to get to, into the calyx and if you get into the calyx, there's gonna be tons of urine, it'll be easy to put the wire in, the stone is not a complete staghorn or something, so you know you're gonna get the stone done in a reasonable amount of time. So I think choosing a case that uh, you know is gonna set yourself up for victory and that, a case that you can build on and then come back and replicate uh, multiple times uh, with other cases like that. And, and th that right there will give you confidence. And anyone who's a surgeon realizes that so much of this is, yeah, it's technical, but it's actually more equally, it's confidence. And having that confidence is key. So set yourself up for victory by choosing simple cases. Um, and I would actually add one other thing for those who have the ability to, I think, um, if you're able to position your patients, if you're doing prone PCNL uh, on a split leg table where you would be, would, where you would have the ability to perhaps perform your ureteroscopy, um, or if you're obviously doing them supine. Uh, for me personally, as I was getting more experience with access, I found it very helpful that one, if I wasn't sure if I had good access, I could throw a ureteroscope and double check. Um, you could potentially, if you have enough assistance, have somebody watch you place the needle. Um, but also having the confidence and knowing that worst case scenario, I'm going to do a ureteroscopy and laser lithotripsy. So if I'm struggling with the access, um, at least I'm not waking the patient up and saying, mm, sorry, we're going to have to figure out a plan B. So you've consented them for a PCNL I possible can, ureteroscopy. I consent all That's my smart. perks for ureteroscopy because, uh, quite frankly, at the end of the procedure, often we'll ureteroscope the, you know, the ureter to make sure mm -hmm. there are no fragments. Um, but I found that that helped me um, have more confidence uh, in tackling more complex cases. Yeah.
Um, so, takes the pressure off. Yeah, so I, I routinely uh, perform ure ureteroscopy as well now. All patients are consented for ureteroscopy. And in fact, you know, speaking about evolution of technique, um, I've now, we do these in a freestanding surgery center. So that has sort of made me think about, I really need to have added layers of safety, uh, particularly with the access step. So initially we would selectively perform retrograde ureteroscopy uh, at time of PCNL, now we just do it with every case. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's quote unquote unnecessary. I mean, you don't really need it. You, you could have done it without, but it does really, it's taught me a lot of things. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it shows you how you can back wall. It shows how you can lift a flap. It shows, you know, little tiny things that radiographically are, you can learn how to pick those up, but then when you see it endoscopically, you're like, okay, like now I see I just mm -hmm. gotta make a small adjustment. In it. Uh, the, the, the part that worried me initially, the reason it was selective initially was because of time constraints. Um, you know, we, uh, we have a fellowship now, we have residents part-time, but you know, we don't always have a second pair of hands in the OR. Um, but really, uh, even single surgeon, we found that we can, it doesn't add a lot of time and it adds a lot of uh, added layers of uh, just knowing where you are. And, and like you said, worst case scenario, you're gonna do your ureteroscopy if you, you know, if something's really difficult and or you can do your ureteroscopy to open up some space mm -hmm. to get your access going, Great to get advice. your PCNL going. Yeah. So I think combined scope surgery is really, I think, maybe kind of how, how this will ultimately be done more routinely once I think more people adopt it. Sure. And, and so <clears throat> another question I have for, for, for both of you, what are things you do in the operating room? So you have your, you've already had your CT, you kind of thought through your access. What are some of the things, once you have the patient in the room, you do to sort of help set yourself up for success in terms of, you know, do you, do you for instance, mark out anatomy on, sure. on the patient? Do you know, how do you, how do you prepare to get your access in the OR? So, so I think, um, so a couple of things. Uh, you mentioned having a split leg table. Um, I actually use a spinal surgery setup uh, with uh, something called an Allen bow frame or a Wilson frame um, that helps to sort of flex the, the patient and I try to position the kidney much like you would with a kidney rest for a, a laparoscopic kidney procedure with the kidney sort of at the, at the apex of, of this frame. I, help, I think that helps to bring the kidney up you know, towards you, uh, can shorten some skin to uh, stone distances and skin to kidney distance. Um, I do turn the fluoroscopy images to the same orientation as, as my hand movement under the C-arm. Mm -hmm. um, I will then you know, map out the 11th rib, the 12th rib, the location of the stone, the calyces. And so you kind of have a visual map, uh, both on the patient as a skin template and then on your fluoro screen, you've got a visual map of you know, what you're doing. And then you, I think that helps set you up for the access. The other thing I'll say is <clears throat> I can do all the planning on the CT. Um, I don't routinely do CT urograms, so I'm usually just doing non-contrast, preferably low dose CTs. Um, so I can say I'm gonna do an access at a certain location and then in essence, completely change the plan. Um, sometimes things like infundibular stenosis or uh, certain anatomy of the calyces are hard to pick up on a non-contrast CT. Mm -hmm. As soon as you do your retrograde um, intraoperatively, I think there's quite a bit of planning that happens as well. Um, so that's another thing. I think you have to be flexible with, with, you know, go in with a plan, but then realize that that plan may need to change depending on what you see in, in sort of real time. So for me, some of the things that I do um, is I try to, you know, the kidney is a very mobile organ, um, but it can be far away. But there are things that you can do on the table to help yourself and push the kidney closer to you. Because the closer the kidney is to the, to the patient's back, the easier they access. So two things that we do. Number one, the rolls that typically we put underneath the patient. Conventionally, most people put those in a uh, vertical fashion. So they're kind of... There's a roll that goes all the way down here, and then perhaps another roll that goes all the way down the other side of the chest. We turn those rolls uh, horizontally. So there's a roll coming across the chest, and then another roll going across the lower abdomen. And that roll going across the lower abdomen, what it does is it kind of pushes the kidney towards the back, especially if you're doing prone access. So it facilitates getting easier access. And then one more step that I do is I'll usually take a towel, or something and ball it up. And then on the side of the kidney that we're uh, getting the access, I'll kind of shove that towel underneath the rib cage 
to further push the kidney backwards towards myself. Uh, this is particularly helpful with a, uh, an obese patient. It also can be very helpful for um, a young female who, whose kidney is probably very mobile. So these are a couple of things that help me. And <clears throat> is there any, um, I guess you've commented on some of the bolsters, but any other specialized equipment you use or, and, or actually, let me rephrase that. Since you've been starting to do ultrasound guided access, has that changed your approach in terms of how you set the patient up? Um, and can you go through a little bit about how that procedure would be different when you're using the ultrasound? Sure. So let me make a comment about ultrasonography. We've only been doing it for about two years now. And what I did in the beginning was I just decided I wanted to learn this technique, but I'd never done it. So every case I would do, I'd take out the ultrasound and I'd ultrasound every patient before I perked them. And after about 10 or so patients, I was like, you know, I can see the calyx. I have a needle. It's only three inches away. If I just drop the needle, <laughs> I think I'm there. And after a couple more cases, one day I finally said, I'm going to just drop this needle. And sure enough, I just dropped it. I saw it come in, opened it up. There was a urine. I said, got it. So uh, again, to what we've been talking about, a lot of things are, uh, they're reasonably, uh, they're concerning for us mentally, but in actuality, in the hands of all of us who are being careful, they're not as scary as it seems. I mean, just by practicing ultrasonography on every patient, even when you're not gonna do ultrasound guided access, that in itself kind of takes the training wheels off. So it kind of makes you, gives you some confidence. Hey, you know, I, I know what the kidney looks like. I know where it is. I, I know cases I would do. I know cases I wouldn't do. And then after a while, you're like, I just probably could just drop the needle in this because I'm just staring at this thing. And this is the 10th time I'm staring at it. How many times or more do I need to stare at this thing? I know what I need to do. Okay. Right. And what, what, what needle? What needle do you use? So uh, any needle is fine, um, though there is a, a newer needle that Boston Scientific has <clears throat> called NaviGuide, and the NaviGuide is uh, extra echogenic, so it's more visible under ultrasonography, and I, I have anecdotally had that sense that I can <clears throat> see this needle easier than uh, other needles. Um, so, but uh, really any needle will do. I think the other thing is when you're dropping the needle, you don't want to drop it super slow because if you go really super slow, it's kind of like watching dust collect in a corner. You won't see it. You have to move fast, relatively fast, carefully, but fast so you can see the movement of the needle coming through the tissue. So again, moving really slow paradoxically makes visualization of the needle very challenging. How about yourself, Davos? Uh, Julia, what, what, uh, what um, what needle do you prefer? Do you have a preferred needle? And yeah, um, so I had, you know, in essence, been using um, the last generation needle from Boston Scientific um, forever. Um, I think there are limitations to this needle, which, uh, particularly when you're learning, can be frustrating. Um, so I found that you know you either had a 12 centimeter size or a 16 centimeter mm -hmm. size. Or, I'm sorry, a 20 centimeter size. So you didn't have a medium size. So sometimes you just need an extra bit, little length, and that, to me anyway, the longer the needle is, the more it can bend, and it makes it harder to you know, perhaps get access. Some people prefer longer needles, but I think a, sh a shorter needle in general uh, makes for learning access uh, a little bit um, less cumbersome. The other thing is you had to seat this needle just right, and you can see there's a little notch for the audience out there. Um, if you got it you know, in the middle of the case, if you had it, got it turned around, uh, created a gap, and then you didn't really have a full needle sticking out. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, if you're using clamps under a C-arm, uh, you know, this could back out on its own. So there were several things about this needle. While it was a good needle, and it's a workhorse needle, and I've, you know, learned how to use it for, uh, like I said, for, for you know, over about a decade. Uh, the new needle, uh, which Roger uh, referenced, um, has a couple of nice features to it. So it does have centimeter marks on the needle itself. So if you're trying to sort of get a sense for how far to push the needle, um, then it gives you a little bit of a visual uh, guide. Um, the needle doesn't back out on its own. It takes a quarter turn for it to, to, uh, for you to actually take it out. So you don't have to worry about the needle backing out on you. And it has a nice space uh, for a clamp to hold the needle uh, while you're working under the C-arm if that's the technique you use. It also has this little um, 
bullseye targeting uh, radio opaque mark that I think is helpful for bullseye technique, um, if that's what you're using. Um, it can also help to put it against the patient's skin if you want to sort of figure out a distance that you want to travel, and then that'll sort of stop you. So it's got a couple of nice things, I think, uh, for teaching purposes, um, and then just practicality as well. Um, again, over the years, I learned how to use to do everything with this needle, and I think it's, it was a fine needle, but there's always room for improvement. And to Roger's point about ultrasound, um, I do believe it's more echogenic, <clears throat> but there may be, um, my understanding is that you need to sort of etch the needle to really get echogenicity. So I don't know if there's a, a further development planned for this needle. Uh, I know this needle came in, the, in Europe was sold with, uh, and overseas was sold with uh, etchings on it to help it be more echogenic. But again, I'm not very familiar with, with ultrasound technique, but I think uh, anything we can do to visualize that needle would be obviously very helpful for ultrasound. And what you can do to uh, make it even more echogenic is take an 11 blade and literally just scratch the needle. Yeah. Um, I know this technique is done in China, and that's how they make their needles more echogenic. Yeah. And, and I just want to uh, add on to some of the comments that Julio made about the newer needle. I think two, two of the underrated things that he mentioned that I think really make this needle a lot easier to use in prior needles is one, that it does lock. Because oftentimes uh, when you're doing percutaneous access, um, especially if, if you don't get access to your first stick and then you're re-sticking, there's always a little blood in the needle. It can get um, a little bit tacky. Mm -hmm. And the needle has a tendency, the actual needle has a tendency to... Um, back out of the uh, stylet, and you're basically then just pushing a blunt tube uh, through the tissue, and it's very hard to get access. Um, and then also having a place uh, designed for uh, a grasper. I use a large Kelly clamp, um, and I think it's really helpful uh, to use a clamp, one, to keep your hands out of the field of fluoroscopy. So, you know, you, a lot of, uh, you could see a lot of old time, uh, both endourologists and uh, interventional radiologists where they have like no hair on their hands because they've radiated their hands so much. Um, and so having that ability to grab the needle with a clamp and keep your hands out of the field of radiation. I don't uh, personally wear lead gloves. Um, I, don't, I don't, we don't have them in our OR, so it's even nicer um, to have that ability. Um, and then you, you mentioned the circular bullseye. What, what technique do you use to get your fluoroscopic access? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think that, um, so terminology in terms of, you know, what, the, you know, so I think if you sort of run through it, um, monoplanar access is where you don't rotate the C-arm. When you have a scope in it, you read a scope in at the same time, sometimes you don't really need to rotate the C-arm. You can sort of uh, adjust the angle um, and, you know, place your needle and in essence, bless you, do a, an access with just a one plane, but typically what you want to have is two planes, right? Because uh, any image that you see on fluoroscopy is 2D, so you're you're missing the other dimension, you're missing the other component. So you're either not sure how deep you really are, or you're not really sure the angle that you're, you're, you're that the needle is uh, is traversing. So actually, today I rarely use bullseye anymore. I, I still use it if I need it, uh, but I think I use uh, what would properly be called biplanar. Um, so, you know, in essence, uh, you get one view like this, mm -hmm. and then you rotate the C-arm to kind of adjust, you know, sort of your depth in terms of where you are this way. Um, I find that to be uh, an easier, number one, you get your needle, you get your hands away, you know, mm -hmm. referencing that point, your, your hands are all naturally away from being under the C-arm, for one. Um, you can get a better angle into the calyx, in my opinion, uh, because you're creating that angle in that AP plane. Um, and then it's not that difficult to adjust the angle in most cases. Sometimes it's a little tricky, and then that's when I'll revert to bullseye, uh, which is sort of the opposite. You move the C-arm usually somewhere around 30 degrees, I think, is what most of us have come up with, but it's not a perfect science by any means. It can be 20 degrees to 25 degrees, 30 degrees. And in essence, put the needle, you know, end, end point on the calyx. So that's where I think this ring comes in as being handy. I will say that it's also tricky um, because, again, I, I am involved with, with training enough at this point that, you know, you really have to adjust for two points now because it's not just creating a point over the end of the calyx. You have to make sure that you're perpendicular uh, I'm sorry, parallel to the image intensifier on the C-arm, uh, 
or else the ring kind of takes on a, a shape of its own. But if you can adjust for both, being sort of perpendicular to the entry point and then parallel to the image intensifier, it kind of gives you two points of reference, and it does really help guide that needle in. Um, I do think it's, it's a nice little touch. Um, and then for triangulation, which is, I think, the other technique, um, I very rarely have ever used triangulation for access anymore. How about yourself, Roger? Well, I think it really is whatever you've been trained to do, stick with that one technique and perfect it. Um, because each one of these techniques has its strengths and weaknesses, but the reality is if you can get good at one of the techniques, that's all that's really important. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, I only did triangulation for two, three years until I did my fellowship. And then I migrated over to bullseye, and now mostly what I do is bullseye, though I can do both. But uh, the point is I try to stick to one technique and just get good at it. I will comment that uh, of, of the techniques, I like bullseye particularly because it gives me access to all of the KLCs in my mind in the safest way. Uh, it's not to say that you can't do use the other techniques for them, but I think for a learner, if you're going to pick one, the bullseye is nice in that it gives you access to the upper, the mid, and the lower and the, with a consistent technique that you can replicate. But uh, if you've been taught how to just to do one, another technique, just stick with it and just perfect it. Um, yeah. I think that's just as reasonable because safety is the most important thing. Yeah, and I'll, I, I, you know, I'll add to that. I, I uh, did my residency and learned bullseye technique. In my fellowship, we did bullseye technique, and I primarily do it. I actually do some triangulation uh, for my lower pole axis. I find it's mm -hmm. helpful. I, I, f I find bullseye to be a little bit more intuitive um, in, this, in the sense that you will pick your calyx, you'll move your C-arm, and you'll just lock everything in a straight line, and you literally just have to hold your hand steady as you advance the needle. You could do it under live fluoroscopy when you're first learning. And for those who are considering trying it, you know, I would encourage a, a few things. Number one is in the advent of CT, for instance, uh, you can measure your angle that you need to access your calyx. Once you've decided which calyx you're going to um, approach for your access, on the CT scan itself, you can measure what that angle is off of AP and then set your C-arm. I find often in the upper pole, it's you know, 10, 15 degrees. It's, sure. very, it's almost very straight up and down. Um, you may also find that, for instance, in the lower pole, there's no true posterior calyx um, in that sense. And so I think that helps that you then can do your retrograde, um, highlight the calyx you want to enter, line the C-arm up at the angle you've already pre-measured, so you sort of take some of the mystery out of it. You sure. know you're going at a posterior calyx. And then I found the ring um, actually fairly helpful, particularly also for my trainees. I, I used to use um, a cook needle with uh, what's called an Amplatz needle holder, which they don't actually, they don't actually make um, anymore. And it had a s sort of radiopaque ring uh, that really facilitated lining everything up. Um, and um, I find that this ring helps especially my trainees because um, I could tell them as they're wandering, um, which is often what happens, and the movements are somewhat counterintuitive to straighten yourself out. You kind of, uh, you know, if your needle, you sometimes have to pull towards yourself to make the needle go away from yourself on fluoroscopy. Um, having that circular bullseye, and it's not overly radiopaque that you can't see your contrast or um, I use air to a pacify the reflecting system. Um, and so I think if you're starting out, the one advantage of bullseye, particularly with the advent of a CT, is you could be confident where your posterior calyx is. You could be confident of the angle of attack. And then honestly, radiographically, you're just in taking your needle, making everything a straight line and understanding your depth. And um, you know, if you have a good dilated kidney, for instance, um, it could be a good way to get started. Um, yeah, I, I, I think those are all excellent comments. And actually, as I think, as I think back to, you know, we, we mentioned earlier that, you know, sort of learned, learned as I went. I mean, I did bullseye for years and years. Mm -hmm. And I do feel that when you're, that it is a very good technique. Um, it's very straightforward and intuitive, and it does give you access to all the calyces. Um, I'll have to look at the CT a little more closely. I, I used to measure a lot of things on CT, and then after a while I decided that I don't know that I can really get accurate information from it, but you're making me think maybe you can get more detailed information, because <laughs> half the time I felt like I would 
measure an angle, and then I'd be like, well, that's not actually the angle. So, but I, I do think that w certainly with with uh, you know 3D reformatting a CT, et cetera. I mean, it's all not, it's not any extra radiation. It's really just mm -hmm. knowing how to use the tools uh, and and you know in, on your uh, actual imaging. So, yeah, that those are interesting points. Yeah, and I, I find you know. I, the angles are, the angles aren't always perfect, and honestly, quite frankly, often you don't know if the angle was perfect, right? right? You got your needle in, you got your axis, you start your case, and if it's not bleeding and you can see the stone, you're you're pretty happy. <laughs> um, uh, where I found CT helps me the most is just having the confidence of understanding where my posterior calyces are, because I I think one of the most challenging things under fluoroscopy is trying to differentiate a posterior and an anterior calyx, um, certainly at first. And mm -hmm. um, for us, air is very helpful with that. Air preferentially fills the posterior calyx, so you right. could uh, inject iodinated contrast and then some air to help differentiate them. Um, but knowing that I have a CT and knowing that I, you know, the second calyx from the top is posterior, um, I find it helps and it helps with my trainees in terms of planning the case um, and, and having a little more confidence. Yeah, and it gives you other things too as far as the planning. It, it helps dictate, you know, is this going to be a complex PCNL that's going to be done uh, in two or maybe even more uh, uh, stages, or is this a simple PCNL that more than likely you're going to be done in, in one case. Um, how hard is the stone? Is it a real soft stone? Uh, makes you concerned that maybe this is more of an infection type stone, though there's probably some historical uh, factors that already have led you to believe that. Or is it a really hard stone and perhaps you're going to need, need a combined ultrasound pneumatic or you know, have uh, ancillary procedures that are going to help uh, augment the, uh, the efficiency of the procedure. Um, and uh, and then, again, with a CAT scan, you're looking for things that might be a source for adverse events, like is the spleen or the liver or the lung, where how close are they in proximity to where you plan on getting your access. So having a CAT scan, I would say, is really the standard of care for getting PCNL procedures, um, as long as that's not an access to care issue. Uh, but in most first world countries, a CT scan should be available, and we highly recommend it. Great. And, and Julio, how do you handle your multi-access cases in the sense if you have a case where you're pretty sure you're going to need more than one access, do you pre-place the accesses at the beginning of the case? Do you kind of just get access as you go on an as-needed basis? How do, you, how do you approach that case, the more complex stone? So um, interestingly, I think, you know, I like to try to get as many accesses up front as possible. Uh, maybe sometimes excessively. <laughs> uh, part of that too is, again, you know, we keep mentioning uh, when you're involved in teaching, um, it's nice, it's actually a good case, it's a good teaching case uh, in terms of access teaching. Uh, when you have a complex uh, collecting system where, again, you can use flexible scopes to get from, you know, point A to point B many times, but a lot of times it's just nicer if you can, you know, get a straight shot into, say, an upper pole that's full of stone and then a lower pole that's full of stone that it might be nice to have two accesses. So I'll typically put multiple accesses, uh, at least wires. So I'll get the needle access and the wire placed. Sometimes I'm not even sure the wire's really in. I won't worry about it too, too much. I, I sort of have a primary point where I'm gonna get started. Uh, but then I'll usually drop in at least one or two other points where I think I may need access. Sometimes I think it's helpful to get the wires in early uh, because things can shift and move around, particularly once you get in with a scope and start working. Uh, Roger mentioned in, uh, earlier that you know, the kidney can be very mobile. Uh, there are cases where it seems like the kidney is scooting you know, all the way past midline. Um, so now if you haven't put a couple wires in, you know, it might be h harder to get there. Now you can sometimes bring the kidney back, so to speak. Uh, Do you see contrast easier in the beginning of the case versus... 40 minutes later, Correct. trying to see contrast with the scope well, on irrigation. That's that's true. And then I also use air. I think when you have a lot of stone, when you have a staghorn, for example, I think air is actually very helpful mm -hmm. because it creates like a halo effect mm -hmm. around the stone and mm -hmm. you don't have to really sort of try to differentiate between is that stone or calyx and stone and, and um, contrast kind of are the same density. Um, so yeah, I think I'll put multiple accesses in up front if I think I'm gonna need it. Now the other scenario is, you go in saying, all I really need is this lower pole access, and then you realize halfway through the case, well, I really could use another access over here. Mm -hmm. So I'll also drop one in later. Mm -hmm. 
but I think I'll try to do as much of the access plane up front as I can. And then when you guys get access, Roger, when you get access, how strongly do you feel that you need a wire all the way down the yurt, or are you comfortable just having a wire curled in the kidney? What's your preference? Yeah, I think uh, it's preferential that the wire is all the way down the, the ureter for several reasons. Number one, a safety factor. You've got a wire that's going to be very difficult to uh, get pulled out accidentally. Number two, when you're dilating it, it gives you uh, stability for the balloon, so it creates purchase and a more stable platform for the balloon. Um, and it, particularly if you're learning the procedure, I think it's best to embrace the safest and most conservative techniques out there. And we would all agree that having a wire through and through all the way down the ureter into the bladder is the most conservative and safest technique. That being said, as you progress and migrate in your skill set, uh, there are cases where sometimes we can't get a wire down the ureter. Perhaps there's a, a UPJ obstruction, a stone blocking it, it's a complete staghorn. You're not going to get the wire down the ureter in this, in this situation. And in that case, uh, it's not a showstopper to me. Uh, if I can't get the wire down the ureter at that point, I just accept this is a little, slightly more difficult case. I'll get one wire in, and I just tell everyone, be careful. Do not pull this wire out. It's our only wire. But... Uh, you just have to be able to uh, you know, uh, adapt and overcome in that situation. But clearly, that's a higher level case and more of a master's level case when you can't get wired down the ureter. Mm -hmm. and, and Julio, do you use a safety wire as well, or do you just use one working wire? No, I, I always use a, so I'll, I'll make a couple comments. Uh, so I think Roger's on point very much so. I mean, if you can get a wire down the ureter to the bladder, by all means, do it. I think when you're learning in the beginning, you want to try to embrace that technique. Then the reality sets in. You start doing more complex cases. And you know sometimes I think the amount of time it's going to take and the amount of fluoro it may take for me to navigate a wire past a staghorn or a you know, UP, large UPJ stone or a UPJ stricture, it's just going to, it's either impossible or it's not really worth the time investment. You know, every minute in the OR that you spend, you're potentially you know, stressing that patient's body in other ways. So I think you have to find a balance point, uh, which comes with time. So ha but having said that, you know, when you get your own access, I think most of us that get our own access have at least some sort of ureteral catheter across the UPJ um, and or we have a scope in, in some of the examples that uh, mm -hmm. Mike and I were talking about. So, um, and then I always have, even if I can't get a, a wire, if I'm not sure it's really in the system or I'm a little, and I'm going to dilate, which again is a bit of a, you know, more of an advanced sort of, of maneuver. You, you comes with time, the intuition that you're, you know, you can feel the stone. The wire doesn't really want to do what it want, you want it to do, but you feel comfortable that it's, it's, it's in the collecting system. I'll put a second wire in always. Uh, because to me, the, the purpose of the safety wire really is the two areas that are of most concern are going to be the UPJ, because that's an area that can get damaged, uh, and across your access tract. So if you have a ureteral catheter or a wire across the UPJ from below, you've sort of covered that area of safety. And if you have a wire next to your access, even if it's not quite exactly where it needs to be in terms of in the collecting system, um, even if it hasn't threaded in as far as you like, um, if you ran into bleeding at some, because the one that's in the sheath, if it's not down the ureter, is almost always going to come out. But the one that's external to the sheath, I think it's, uh, that's actually hard to pull out once the sheath is in. And that's really going to give you the ability to, at some point, and hopefully this never happens to you, uh, but if you do enough of them, if you have bleeding from your tract, and I do tubeless surgery, so I, I'm, in essence, rarely, if ever, leaving a nephrostomy tube, so I'm really relying on that safety wire across the track at the end to see, well, if I need to get back in, do I need to put a tamponade balloon in? You know, so, so I'm very much about having safety wires. Um, when I do ureteroscopy from below, which is now much, very much the routine, I also have a safety wire next to the access sheath, which some people think is excessive. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, you know, especially when you have trainees, um, you know, the, having safety wires is, it's never a bad thing. It's like, uh, I, uh, there's a quote, right? If you, it's like uh, riding a motorcycle without a helmet Maybe, is yeah. no safety wire. <laughs> the, 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 the only difference between a percutaneous stone surgery and a motorcycle accident is a safety guide wire. Yeah. yeah. Um, so.
Yeah, I think for, for us, I generally also use two wires and prefer to get them uh, down the girder. Now that we do a lot of uh, prone, well, we almost exclusively do this prone split leg, we find that we're able to get a wire uh, through and through, so through the flank, out the urethra. Right. In those cases, I don't use a second safety wire because I can actually put a little plastic clamp on the one out the urethra, and it's physically impossible to lose that wire. Um, and I don't feel it's necessary to have a second wire. Um, I also wanted to highlight one thing you, you mentioned briefly, you know, the open-ended catheter that we all place to facilitate our access. I, I would encourage urologists who have their interventional radiologists get their access to take the time to put an open-ended catheter at the beginning of the case per urethra up into the kidney. Even if you're not gonna get your, even if you're not gonna change the access point, it gives you a great target uh, when you're trying to maneuver a wire down the ureter, um, it often can help you distend the kidney up um, if you're, you know, concerned about where you're dilating into. And it's a great bailout. Like if you're, if at the end of the case, um, you know, you lose access percutaneously for some reason, at least you could be assured that you could drain the kidney because you have a catheter going from the kidney out the urethra. Uh, you could always at a later time convert it to a JJ stent if necessary. So I, I think it's a really nice added element of safety, even if you're not getting your own access. It adds a little bit of time to the case, um, but honestly, it takes, the cystoscopic portion takes about five, five minutes, and right. you could do it with a flexible scope. You could put the patient frog leg on, on the table without having to totally prep, and, prep them out for a, you know, a rigid cystoscopy. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say, um, and to that end, we use an uh, occlusion ureteral balloon, so it's a five French uh, retrograde catheter. And at the very tip of the catheter, you can inflate the, uh, the a balloon, which then you can seat at the UPJ. And that serves several advantages. One, when you do your retrograde, it ensures that the contrast sits up there and you can create some nice artificial hydronephrosis, which will make your access easier. Uh, number two, uh, when you start breaking up your stone, the fragments won't fall down the ureter. Um, so uh, we use this routinely, and we found this helpful for those reasons. So I don't, I haven't used that, and I use it a couple of times, Roger. So I had a couple of questions for you. Sure. Um, so the balloon is fairly, um, it's not like a dilating balloon in terms no. of the, the pressure that it can exert. So in terms of it causing injury, you're not concerned about that. You haven't seen that. Uh, Actually, it can cause injury if you inflate it inside the ureter. Right. It will perforate the ureter. Okay. Because it goes to almost 30 French, I believe, in size. So you definitely, you need to know where it is before you inflate it. In fact, I will inflate it under uh, fluoroscopy. I never f inflate it blind. Okay. Um, so I make sure that it's above the UPJ, inflate it, and then under live fluoro, I'll just bring it back till it seats right at the UPJ. I will tell you, I have injured ureters where it's been inflated inside the ureter, and then afterward, there's a large perforation. Fortunately, they heal up, but that's obviously not an uh, ideal outcome. And then the second question I had about them is, I mean, if, if you don't have stone in the renal pelvis, sure, that I think this works well. I mean, have you found it difficult to use if you've got large renal pelvis or UPJ stone, or is that not really a factor in terms of seating? Because you can certainly imagine if you have an yeah. open pelvis, sure. you can inflate it and then sort of bring it back down. But if you've got stone impacting that area... Yeah, there, there are cases definitely where you I can't it. seat the, uh, the balloon because the stone is blocking my path to get right. down there. You're right. Um, sometimes what we've done is as the stone gets fragmented, and then we finally have the ability to, to bring it down to the UPJ midway through the case. We'll then say, okay, let's get that balloon down there to sure. kind of minimize fragments that are falling down the ureter. So, yeah, they're, they're, you kind of have to take each, each one as they come and be able to pivot. Are there times that you don't inflate the balloon? You just use it as a sort of non... Or do you always inflate the balloon? Now? I mean, there's definitely a, there's a cost to the balloon over a five <clears throat> French ureteral <clears throat> catheter, and I've recognized that. And so if I, if I don't anticipate that I'm going to be able to inflate a balloon, then I'll just preferentially use a standard five or six French ureteral catheter. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the counter to that is, now that I'm thinking about it here, is there's a cost to me opening a flexible ureter scope at the end of my case, look down the ureter for those fragments yeah. that invariably pass. So I guess um, either, either way, you're kind of... Yeah, you can <laughs> spin this many ways here. Um, um, either way, I mean, I always, um, at the end of the case, 
the majority of cases, we look down the ureter, um, either with the flexible cystoscope as far as we can go, or we'll throw a yeah. ureter scope depending on and it. Even with a case, uh, you know, a, a, a scope that's uh, non-disposable, um, there is a cost because every time you use it, you know that it has a life cycle, and somewhere around 15 to 30 times at some point it's going to break, and even with the service contract, it just never comes back the same. So, yeah, the use of a balloon, in theory, can really save your flexible ureter scopes and minimize a cost on that end, but these are all kind of cost analyses that have not been done. Sure, fair enough. And what do you guys do, or what do you guys do if you're struggling to get access? Do you have any... Any tips or tricks? Is there something you'll do, for instance, with the ureter scope if you're if you're really having a hard time mm -hmm. confidently getting into a calyx? So there's a couple things I think. Um, so using air, I think, is a good way. Sometimes even with a ureter scope in the kidney, it's not always intuitive to know exactly where you are. So actually allowing a little bit of air into the system, the air does preferentially go to the posterior calyx. Um, I think that that's, that's helpful. I'll also say that sometimes, for whatever reason, you know, most of the time you can tackle a stone from multiple, you know, it doesn't have to be a lower pole case. You could come at it from the upper pole and come down to the upper pole. Or like Roger said, you know, if you're comfortable with the lower pole, it doesn't mean you can't get to the other poles. But sometimes I just feel like a certain calyx just doesn't, it isn't, it isn't working out for me. <laughs> and I've probably Swiss cheesed it as well, right? So I just move on to another spot. I say, where's a secondary point that I think I can make this work? And let me just move on, and maybe I'll come back to that calyx later. Um, so I think there's some of that. Uh, and I think, you know, most of the time when I struggle with access at this point, I say to myself, there's something about this anatomy that I'm not getting, right? Because I know enough about sort of how access works and the, in general how most kidneys anatomy is. So there must be something I'm missing. And I try to actually use it as a way to learn and continue to evolve my understanding and my technique because I say just something isn't quite right. You know, when you're teaching a trainee, you can see, oh, this is the mistake that they're making. But I sort of imagine if somebody was watching me who has even more expertise than me, what might they be able to say to me? So I try to take that opportunity to, to learn from it. But, you know, we all struggle. Um, it happens. Thankfully, it happens less and less, uh, <laughs> I, I feel like now. But, um, but yeah, I think, you know, you can, you know, trying to figure, just, I think just, just saying, hey, maybe I need to, sometimes I even hand the needle over to, uh, to the resident and say, well, you give it a try. Maybe I'm just, you know, maybe I'm just having a bad day. Maybe you can get it in. Maybe I can coach you better than I can do it myself. I think uh, I always tell the residents, um, the most important thing is the safety of the patient. So at some point doing all these cases, you're going to do what I call the walk of shame. <laughs> you have failed to get access, and it's a horrible feeling. Patient was asleep, the case was not completed, and you got to walk down to the family room and the waiting room and tell the family, guess what? We couldn't get in. We woke up your family member, and we need to talk about another alternative. Um, but that you need to be able to do that because... Mm -hmm. It's the true. inability to face that music and to make that decision could lead to a catastrophic event because the alternative is you tell yourself, well, I'm not going to leave this room until I get that access. And how do I know that? Because I've been there. <laughs> what ends up happening is the patient gets transfused or potentially loses their kidney. So at some point, and only you would know this, there's a threshold where you say enough is enough. For the safety of this patient, I'm going to go back and do the walk of shame. And usually my opening line to the family is, I just want to let you know your, your family member's safe. And honestly, of all the things that matter between getting stone free and whatever technique you use, they just want to know that the patient's safe. And that's a great consolation. Oh, not the best, right? They came there for surgery. But more important, they want to know my loved one is leaving this hospital safe. And I, I don't, you know, we're kind of laugh about it, but the reality is I think this is a really important point to know at a certain point you need to stop. But to the point, your, to your question about what are some things that we can do to facilitate it, um, again, I think doing maneuvers, like I talked about using the bolsters to push the kidney backwards towards the, um, the posterior portion of the kidney is important. Um, what I do with my contrast is I always put in methylene blue and I started doing this over the past couple of months, uh, and I, I found this really interesting because sometimes your 
you got the needle in the collecting system and you op- you take out the obturator and perhaps you put a syringe on there and you're trying to draw back to hopefully seeing that flash of urine, you see a mixture of blood and urine. You're like, well, is that blood or is that urine? Hmm. I'm not really sure. I've stuck this person several times. It's Maybe it is blood with urine, right? But it's confusing. But if you have methylene blue in there, it's a no-brainer. It's either blue or it is not blue. So it's right. very obvious when you're in the collecting system. And we routinely now use... We just take a squirt of methylene blue. There's no special amount. As you all know, you just take a drop of it and the whole thing turns blue. <laughs> so uh, blue is a great color to see is what I tell the residents. Yeah, that's, good, I, that's I, a good trick. I, uh, I would uh, also add to some of your comments, Roger. I think it's important to counsel your patients preoperatively that you may not be able to obtain right. percutaneous access and you may need to sort of come up with a plan B. I think that um, we like to sort of quote our stone free rates or and tell patients, oh, we're going to get every little crumb out, and that's why we're doing this more invasive procedure. But um, the more you can prepare patients up front, the easier that walk of shame is. Um, I'll also give, again, a plug for being able to do these cases prone split. Like, personally, that if I'm really struggling to get access, I'll pull a laser out. And either I'll laser with the intent to actually treat the stone, and it may mean a stage procedure, or I will laser with the intent to create enough space where I can then better either identify an appropriate calyx or a lot of times I find for me when I'm struggling to get access, um, I'll get the needle where I want it to be. I can physically feel the stone, but then I just cannot get a wire even into that calyx um, because the stone is so adherent to the tissue uh, that there is literally no space. And uh, though on occasion, yes, I will dilate knowing my wire is somewhere. Proximity. <laughs> um, I, don't, uh, I don't enjoy those cases, and I don't do it very frequently. I much prefer to ha- at least have the wire in the system, sure. in, the, in the kidney. Um, and so I think that's another <clears throat> trick that even if you're not going to do endoscopic guided access, if you're able to have access to the urethra during the case, worst case scenario is you put up a, a flexible urethra scope and you right. start lasering, you wake the patient <clears throat> up. Um, yeah, and I, you know, so we now routinely, our setup includes, we don't use a split leg, but the table we use, we're able to, we have access to the urethra, uh, so we can do retrograde surgery anytime, and I, ex- exactly what you're saying. I mean, I think, uh, you know, Roger, you don't have to do the walk of shame, because what you can consent them for <laughs> is PCNL with ureteroscopy, and, if, and you can always say to them, look, if for some reason we can't get access, then we do ureteroscopy, and then what you go out and tell the family is, your loved one's safe, and we did stage one ureteroscopy. We're coming back for stage two. Let's get the show on the road. <laughs> I want to say one of the thing, other trick I do in the contrast, thanks, and that's great, is um, I actually put in 5,000 units of heparin into the contrast. It minimizes the amount of clot formation. This is particularly helpful if you're doing um, smaller perks or mini perks where clot formation can really become a problem. I mean, in a standard case, it's not as, as big of a deal because your lithoclast or whatever device you're using will just suck out the clots. But for the uh, smaller, uh, more miniaturized PCNL cases, clot formation can really become problematic because removing them is difficult. So I always mix in 5,000 units of heparin into the methylene blue in the contrast, and I've not seen any bleeding problems. It's all localized staying in the, in the collecting system. It's not terribly uh, reabsorbed. It does not become a problem for us. So, so I have a, I have a, I have a question for you guys, and I, I'll, after you guys end, I'll tell you my experience. How do you determine when enough is enough? Do you, do you, do you count the number of sticks you've done, and and how how has that approach changed over time? I could tell you for for me, um, probably the reverse. I'm I'll keep going sometimes longer uh, because I have the confidence eventually I'll get into the kidney. Um, but how do you? How do you make that determination? So, and better and better yet, how, do, how does somebody who's just starting make that determination? So let me answer that question with a, a case that I did when I was a resident. It was the very last case. I did it with the chairman, and I'd done maybe 20 or so perks as a resident, so I was feeling pretty confident I can get my own access as a chief at that point. And we spent about two hours trying to get access. So uh, and then suddenly there was some ruffling going on behind the curtain. We said, what are you guys doing? They said, oh, we're giving some pressors. I'm like, what do you mean pressors? Well, the patient's dropping her pressure. And all of a sudden, next thing he goes, she's pulseless. I'm like, what? She's pulseless. I'm like, oh, my God. 14 units later, she uh, left the hospital. Actually, she walked out of the hospital a couple of days later. But after 14 units, uh, we almost opened her up and took out her kidney and went down the IR, blah, blah, blah. The point being is y- there's a certain point – 
two hours of trying to get access, I learned, is way too long. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think it's two hours. I think that time limit is probably much shorter. Um, I always tell our trainees that the kidney is not a pin cushion. I mean, you know, we want to get access and a single or two or three needles is really no big deal. But at a certain point, you know, you're setting yourself up for bleeding or long term, you may set yourself for an AV fistula or a pseudo aneurysm the more you stick this kidney. So I don't know what the right number is. Uh, it's definitely way under 10 sticks, I would say. More like somewhere around five is probably more than adequate. And at that point, maybe you should be considering alternative methods. Interesting. Um, I don't know that I've ever really considered this question in terms of uh, number of sticks yeah, or time. I mean, I think that's it's a great question. Yeah. So I don't know that I have a specific answer. Um, I, you know, as I look over my learning curve, I think one thing that's going to be challenging is if you used five sticks as your cutoff, you know, it, in the beginning, it may take you 10 sticks to get, or 15, and, and I agree with you, Roger, I think there's a limit, but I, I don't know that five is the right number. I think um, you have to use a little bit of intuition, and uh, I look at floral times. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you're, I don't know what your guys' floral times are, but, you know, I think a couple minutes of fluoro, less than five minutes of fluoro is probably what you what you'd be shooting for in terms of broadly speaking. As you get better and better, we get fluoro times well under a minute now. Sometimes my fluoro times are as short as my ure ureteroscopy times, so uh, you know they're twenty seconds. But um, I also think going from one calyx to another. So maybe you try. I would say I try up to five sticks in one calyx. If that's not working out, then I usually go to a secondary point. At this point in my career, thankfully, I feel like that's, you know, usually within 10 sticks at most I'm getting an access. Um, I agree with you, two hours is too long, yeah. but probably 15 minutes to half an hour and less than five sticks per site is kind of what I would throw out as a starting point for the conversation, but I don't, I don't think I, I know the answer. I think, that, yeah. I think your point's fine. Maybe I erred on the side of being conservative with five, but, you know, I, I, that yeah. continuum right, somewhere, I, I'm totally in agreement with that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly, I, I don't know of any data to, to right. or any, I honestly don't know, I don't know of anybody who does count six. I will tell you that there is good data in PCNL to suggest the longer the case, the more likely the patient is to require transfusion, sure. and the more likely the patient is to get, to have post-operative sepsis. And so um, I, I arbitrarily will end my cases in the three to four hour range, even if I'm tackling a big stone, even if things are going well, I will keep an eye on the clock. And if the patient's been prone for three to four hours, I will stop. And if this patient's Absolutely. not stone free, we'll put a tube in and come back. Um, and as far as the access question, I agree. I don't count my sticks, but I do know that there's a certain point. I would say somewhere in the 15 to 30 minute range of actual attempting access, I think if you're Quite frankly, unless you are consciously doing something to change the scenario, you're likely just beating your head against the wall. Right. And you sometimes just need to stop, take a deep breath, either go out, do your walk of shame, and just say, listen, we need a plan B. If you have the ability to do your plan B in the OR, so much the better. Um, but it's, it's always important to remember that even, um, you know, the quote-unquote experts, there are cases people can't get access to and, um, and that it's okay to, to acknowledge that and to stop and move on. I like that 15 to 30 minutes. That's probably a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. That's somewhere usually where I'm going to give up. 15, right. 30 minutes, I've had enough. I just, it's not working. And again, I think that's once you've gotten to a point where you, you know, we, I'm, most of us, I think, can routinely get access in well under 10 minutes or five minutes. So once you get to that point where you're getting access in a few minutes, then 15 minutes feels like an hour. Yeah. You're like, what's yeah. happening? Yeah. Like, well, why yeah. am I doing this? Like, what, what's wrong? Like, and 30 then, minutes feels like eternity. Yeah, like, 30 okay, minutes. Now just, I'm done. Right. So, I mean, and the, I, the, the alarm on the C arm has gone off and, twice already. So it's and, like. And I, and I also want to clarify one thing for, for those who are watching. We're not talking, I'm not, I would not say 30 minutes of like, I got my wire, my balloon. We're talking about needle sticks. Right. Right. So for those who are learning, certainly when I, you know, when I have fellows or trainees doing that portion of the case, it'll take longer because each step takes longer. Uh, what we're really so, talking about is the actual like getting into the kidney. If you are unable to actually get into the kidney with multiple sticks, I would say within 30 minutes, it's probably time time for a plan B. Right. Um, I'm going to move on to sort of the last set of questions, and that, that pertains to 
So you've, you've gotten your access, you've done your case, and so how do you drain the patient and how do you determine what drainage tubes you're gonna use? So I've shifted away from routinely placing nephrostomy tubes. Um, I put a, a hemostatic plug into the tract on every case. Um, the only cases I leave a nephrostomy tube are cases that are, that are obviously infected. Even if I'm gonna come back for a second look procedure, I don't, usually I'm not gonna necessarily dilate that same area again. That area is probably already cleaned out, so I don't necessarily feel that I need a tube to get back in to that area. Um, so I usually, I would say 99% of the time now, there's no nephrostomy tube in the stent in, in just about every case. The stent is because I do ureteroscopy routinely, uh, and I do like having something to drain the kidney, and I'm starting to consider totally tubeless surgery, but I've only very much, you know, minimal st stepped in that direction. I think there are three situations where I will leave a nephrostomy tube, but otherwise routine PCNL um, is really migrated to this tubeless concept where we leave a stent in there, so it's not truly tubeless. So those, most of my cases are tubeless, but there are three situations where I will leave a nephrostomy tube. Number one, if I'm planning a staged case and I'm planning on coming back two days later to finish up the case, I'll leave a tube. Number two, if there's a uh, concern for ongoing sepsis, you know, the patient's Absolutely. dropping their pressure intraoperatively, I'm gonna maximize drainage by having a nephrostomy tube. And number three is if there's a uh, concern for hemorrhage uh, significant bleeding, then I will leave a nephrostomy tube. However, I w do want to put a caveat to that last comment. Um, most of the time, you know, we see bleeding, and I'm not sure, and this may sound a little heretical to uh, some of my older predecessors, I'm not sure that leaving a nephrostomy tube actually stops bleeding. I mean, let's talk about right. this. So <laughs> patients bleeding in the kidney, let's say you're doing a partial nephrectomy or something, do you actually think leaving a tube across that area is going to stop the bleeding? Or, or is that a wick for now, the bleeding? What, what is that really doing? Because if they're really bleeding that bad, we're probably going down an interventional radiology for a squirt, mm -hmm. let's be honest. Or number two, we're, we're gonna open up the kidney and take it out. If it's really bleeding that bad after you've gone, tried supportive measures with transfusions, et cetera. So I just wanna say that, you know, this concept that the, that the nephrostomy tube, a big 30 French balloon is gonna stop your bleeding. Um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not convinced about that. Honestly, at that point, I, I'm heading down to IR or I'm thinking about just opening up and taking out the kidney right, right then and there in the OR. So um, I'll just, that's my last comment yeah. on that. Well, I, I echo those comments, Roger. I mean, that's why I agree with your first two. I mean, certainly for secondary look procedures and for sepsis, I think nephrostomy tubes are, those are great reasons. But I don't know that, I don't even think that the science supports nephrostomy tubes really, truly uh, decreasing bleeding risk, so. Right. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, for me, I, I leave an open-ended catheter for the majority of my patients' as drainage and take it out the following morning. Um, I leave double J stents if I do a super costal stick because I worry about um, pleural uh, sure. uh, perf uh, fluid in the pleura. Um, and occasionally I'll leave a double J. And actually for my super costal sticks, I'll leave a double J stent with a string attached to the Foley. And if their post-op x-ray looks okay, I'll take them both out the next morning. That's nice. um, and very rarely. So I would say mo the majority of my patients go home without us any tubes inside of them. Um, uh, when we do percutaneous cases. And when we do a, a leave a stent, we have the string coming out of their back with a little bandage over the back, and then they come back to my clinic three or four days later. Not You don't want to wait more than three or four days later because then you can't pull it out because the skin epithelializes. Right. Mm -hmm. How do I know? So, um, <laughs> so and, and then you just have, the nurses can actually, I've taught my nurses just pull the stent out. So you don't have to scope these patients yeah. and you can save them the whole post-op cystoscopy and it's quite nice. So, yeah, I agree. I think getting tubes out uh, anymore, I think in most cases that go routinely, you can get them out within two, three days, and basically, or like you, they're yeah. tubeless post up day one. I think tubes are not, patients don't like tubes. No. <laughs> so getting rid of them either during the case, uh, right after your case, or soon thereafter is, I think, probably the, the way to go. Okay. I think that's, uh, that's all we have. So thanks, Good guys. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, yeah. Mike. Yeah, thanks. Roger. All right. Cool.